Hello everyone and welcome, welcome again to another series in our CPD in 43. Uh, this is today with, uh, we're uh, happy to welcome Darren Evans. We've got a number of people from the team uh, going to be speaking. Uh, this is particularly focused on achieving net zero carbon in construction. Um, so I'd like to thank our speakers for um, uh, agreeing to speak today and I will hand it straight over to them. As usual, I'll be here and manning the chat box and we'll obviously welcome questions for our Q&A session towards the end. Uh, but for the moment, I will hand it straight over to um, Darren, Brendan and Kashiba and team and I will disappear off into the background. Thanks very much. Welcome to everybody. My name's Darren. I founded the company in 2007. Back in 2007, I had the idea that um, the way that the world was going to shift from where it currently was to where it needs to be in order for uh, buildings to emit uh, minimal CO2 emissions, um, it would be a huge transition. And so this organization really is built in effect to help people bridge from where they're at to where they are want to be. So areas that we cover is everything to do with Part L. Um, I guess the mandatory things um, uh, relating to uh, regulations. And then we also do the aspirational, which at the moment is uh, what Brandon's going to be covering off in, uh, in the talk today around net zero, not just in construction, um, but also helping to reduce um, emissions in, in other areas as well. There's a huge amount of services that we have as an organization and so feel free to visit the website and to get some more detail about how we are and the way that we work. We are a B Corp organization um, which uh, means a lot to us. It was something that we attained uh, just early part of this year but I want to now introduce you to Brandon who will go through the presentation and uh, hope that you enjoy and get some good questions stored up for later on. Hello everyone, hopefully you can see my screen, hear my hear my voice, watch my little mouse zooming around here. Um, cool, so we're gonna crack on and get going right now. Um, in our session today, I got like five minutes on climate change and then we go into operational carbon, which depending on your, you know, your background might be a little bit more familiar to most of you. And then embodied carbon, which is kind of new. And, and then uh, I go through a net zero case study at the end. Without further ado, so if you didn't get the memo, uh, our climate's on fire. Uh, well, yeah, I, I joke because it, it helps me cope. <laughs> uh, we're very much on the target for three degrees C uh, in with the COP stuff in the news at the moment in Egypt. This is a pretty important topic, um, but we're trying to stay below 1.5 degrees C. Uh, and most of our trajectories, the last time I put this together, it, it, nothing's changed. We're still uh, Looking pretty, looking pretty bad in that respect, where our trajectory is going. Um, if I wanted to pick one thing, though, one effect of what climate change could do, and this is the biggest one, this is the one that keeps me up at night, keeps me from sleeping, is the migration of people due to, 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 to sea level rise and other weather conditions that would push them to, to, to migrate. Um, the city of The Hague, potentially be underwater by 2050, 2100, 20, 20, 2100. That's 3.8 million people. Um, so just, that's kind of scary stuff, in my opinion. So what can we do about it? Well, this is the important thing. This is the whole point. Why us? Why our industry? Why the construction industry? Is because depending on how you slice it, 30 to 50%, sometimes the estimates are even higher of what percentage of all the world's emissions come from the built environment, running the buildings, building the buildings, and transporting the material to make those buildings around the planet. Um, the construction industry is, is huge, has a huge impact. So if we can decarbonize our, our industry, we're, you know, we're really in prepped and, and actually able to make significant change uh, to reducing global climate change. Uh, anyway. So, whole life carbon. If there's anything else that you guys get out of this presentation today, I want you guys to be thinking in terms of whole life carbon. Everybody's talking about that in the same way, but simply put, that's the culmination of all the operational carbon for the building annually, and then the embodied carbon to make that building 
and we'll get into those specifically, but whole life carbon. So operational carbon, uh, this is uh, hopefully all of the running carbon, all of the energy, all of the carbon associated with the energy that the building would consume is going to be or want to be fully powered by renewable energy. And this would then make that zero or negative. Obviously, the decarbonization of the grid in the UK is one of the massive success stories in the UK. You guys should really be proud of what your country has done in the last decade in that in that space. Um, but that alone is not going to get you there because there's energy capacity issues, right? So we're still trying to drive down the demand and also decarbonize the grid at the same time to try to get to that to that end goal. Um, historically, the government has broken these emissions down into two main categories, um, regulated emissions, which is governed by Part L, which would be SAP assessments for, for houses, um, SBEM assessments for, for non-residential buildings. Um, that would be comprised of the heating, the hot water, electricity for lightings and fans, uh, pumps, that sort of thing. Everything to, to make the guts of the building run. And then you get the unregulated emissions, which are cooking emissions, which are appliances, uh, specifically like a TV. How many plasma TVs does a person have? Well, that changes. But how many, how much energy that building takes to stay at 20 degrees temperature comfortable all the time? Well, that's going to stay pretty much the same based on the building performance. Uh, and that's why the government has regulated those emissions and kind of ignored, if you want to put it that way, the unregulated emissions. Now, this is the big problem is because traditionally the energy in the, the energy consumption of the buildings was so high that the unregulated is just not important because the regulated emissions were, were, were consuming specifically around space heating. Uh, uninsulated buildings in the, you know, from, from decades ago that are still in operation today. Um, if you take th this basic approach, though, is, is that you add insulation, start making the fabric performance better, and then you start to find efficiencies to drive that regulated emissions down. And then the government is agreeing or assuming that the decarbonation of the grid will kind of solve the electrical problem uh, for itself, and, and it'll be self-regulated by the market, right? Because if a person can't afford eight plasma TVs, they're only going to turn on one. Um, as long as the grid simultaneously goes towards zero carbon. And, and, and it's, it's not there yet, um, but a few days a year, you might have enough renewable energy in Scotland that's, that's a part of the grid that you get one day or something. Um, but it, you know, it's getting there. And then, anyway. <clears throat> All right, this is our first poll. Hopefully this works. There's a lot of you on the poll. So just generally speaking, based on your guys' opinion, what do you think, which of these low and zero carbon technologies do you guys think has the highest impact on operational carbon? Kind of an open-ended question. So fabric insulation, triple glazing windows, that sort of thing. MVHR and air tightness. Heat pump technology. Or solar photovoltaic technology. And I'll give you a minute to have a think. All righty, some of the stuff's coming in. 70 of you have already responded, so we'll give it a few more. There we go. Okay, the vast majority of everybody is picking fabric first. Right, right. We want that. <laughs> you can't have a sustainable building if there's no insulation in it, right? So, I mean, that's good. Um, it deba the debates now is where are we with regards to that fabric performance? Um, in the in the in the in the world of regs, so seventy percent of you got the memo because you know fabric first is the important part. But how far do we take that? How far down that diminishing curve line we get before we start changing our approach? And and it, this is where we are in regs, and now moving into the new regs because it, Part L has just come out with the new regs. Heat pump technology is definitely coming into its own. If if you're not looking at or 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 specifying heat pump technology, you're going to get left behind really quickly um, because the fabric performance is, is already there. 
um, for new build anyway. So fabric energy efficiency, right? Okay, so insulation, air tightness, high performance glazing, not necessarily triple glazing, although there that is there is a, it is a debate, right? Uh, and then just making smart use of the solar energy that you you have you, you have moving in to the building. Um, one more quick fire poll. In the average UK house, now this is including existing houses. I might just in the average UK house, what percentage of total energy consumption comes from hot water heating? Fifty percent. 30%, 25, or 15. Imagine a traditional end terrace house, um, not a flat, the flat would change this. See what most of you are thinking, 50%, okay. All right, so you guys are split between 50 and 33. I think this is a testament to to how how much uh, you guys are working in the new build space because a traditional house is using fifty percent of it is 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 pretty much coming the energy demand to to meet the space heating demand is almost all coming from space heating. This is this is part of the reason. Now, if you take a new build house, this would be quite a bit different. The pie or a flat where you have a mid floor flat where where there's a lot of shared walls, that proportion will change. But a traditional end terrace cliche building that you see e everywhere um, around the country, it, it, you know, you get about 25% um, of the demand from hot water. So what about passive house? Most of you guys have ho hopefully have heard about this this particular scheme. It's it's a German standard. To me, it's it's a it's a resident comfort standard. I am also a passive house assessor. Uh, so. This 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 is a pretty old school 1970s approach to passive house where we got big glazed windows. That the modern passive houses don't look like this. But the simple idea is we're maximizing the gains. Um, we're not maximizing the gains. We're controlling the gains, not losing any heat through the fabric by super insulating the fabric, making sure that it's super airtight, and then using a ventilation system to control our losses, uh, and then using decent normal shading measures to make sure that we're not overheating in, in summer because overheating is a, is, a, is a real problem as you guys know in, in the industry. And so what about passive house? Well, it does exactly what you'd expect it to do on the tin. It, it really does work. 50% of all the space heating emissions go away. Um, you do sometimes still have a little bit left over for, uh, and that's why you might need a radiator just to control. A lot of times it goes in the lounge a little radiator in the lounge. We still have to deal with our hot water though, and we still need to decarbonize the rest of the electricity demand. So Passive House Classic can only just get you so far before we have to start moving into renewable tech, before we have to start moving into um, um, heat pump technology anyway to take care of, of some of those other energy demands that, that aren't just around space heating. Um, but it is a, a really good starting point and, and and it is a sliding scale. I mean, if you're not all the way to passive house, passive house has particular, you know, design criteria metrics that are that are wonderful. Um, uh, but it, it, you know, it, there are downsides to passive house, uh, which we'll kind of hopefully go through now. So this is this is a pretty interesting graph. Uh, I'll kind of talk you through it. So we've done four different houses um, in SAP and also in passive house. So these are passive house certified units that were also modeled in SAP. These are the results of the SAP modeling. Why SAP modeling? Because it's what's required for, for uh, building regulations. It's what the EPCs are created on, and it's what the, the UK uses for its energy model estimates. So it's how we compare a, a passive house unit against a, a, a traditional house. Uh, not getting into the model differences, but basically we break down the energy into different categories. So our unregulated estimate which would be all of my plasma TVs, my my refrigerator, uh, uh, my my aquarium, right? Okay, <laughs> that's all that's all the same because the because the exact same house type was used, the exact same floor area. Two point six nine people live in this house in this make believe house. So we're going to take that energy demand right out of the mix, and you can see how high it is 
you know, it's almost 3,100 for a 95 square meter, you know, unit. But that's all electricity and it's all exactly the same. Then we take our delivered energy. This would be all of the energy from these remaining categories. Hot water, space heating being the big two. Uh, one of the things that people worry about in the, is the fans in the passive house is that the fans are bigger. They're, they're circulating more air. They're inputting and extracting. Does that take more energy? The short answer is yes, it does take a little more energy to use those, those better, more powerful fans. However, uh, in the grand scheme of things, it, it's almost negligible in, in the grand scheme of things. The, that extra little bit of electricity compared to the other fans that we're, we're using is um, not important. We kind of just ignore that. So really the debate comes down to the space heating and the hot water. And this is where we get into the, the normal house, which is this big one, and our passive house house. And then we have the same house with a heat pump and the, and the passive house with a heat pump. And, and you can see here on the hot water specifically, the energy demand is divided by the efficiency of the heat pump. All of this entire graph is in kilowatt hours, not carbon, you know, it's in actual energy. And um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. This is a very full graph. Normally I would take questions <laughs> on this graph, but I try to explain, but basically the idea is, you get such big gains from the heat pumps because you're dividing the, the demand by the efficiency of the heat pump. And they're like 300 uh, percent efficient. Usually a modern heat pump will be that or better. Uh, some of the other efficiencies, if they're going through double cycles, they can get even upwards of 400 percent efficient. Some of the ground source units, that sort of thing. OK. So heat pumps are the best thing since sliced bread. So what's the problem with them? Well, there's always problems. There's always a, a flip to the, the other side of the coin. But the answer is the cost. Running them is more because electricity costs more than gas. And I've updated this to, to reflect the new current state of our energy pricing. Uh, we're capped at 34 and 10. If I'm not and you can see here the, 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 the running cost per year. This is only the, the regulated energy. The unregulated would be on top of this and standing charges. So this is the, just the difference if I'm going to meet my demand. And this isn't a new house. This isn't even an older house. You can see the difference. Passive house just performs better. Obviously, with passive house, you're going to have potentially more capital cost investment into that property. Uh, but in terms of how it's going to perform over time, in terms of running costs, it just will. Um, and as we move into passive house with a heat pump, you know, that's that's where we would would want to be, uh, you know, and that's hot water and and space heating annually. Hopefully that makes sense. I can't I can't change the cost of gas, to, <laughs> but I think over time, the biggest problem or the biggest point is we need to be making our new build net zero now because. And this is how we do it. This is part of how we do it. And, and we need to do that now because we're stopping the problem from getting worse. Uh, it, the first thing we need to do is stop making the problem worse before we can start trying to solve the retrofit market in the UK, which is it's a massive problem. I know how do you retrofit all the existing houses to, to a standard that, that is, is worthy of their. Yeah, anyway, worthy of the future. Now we're going to embodied carbon. Um, write down your little questions for the end. Hopefully, hopefully that all made sense. Um, got to stay on pace. Got to be done in 43 minutes. So embodied carbon, here we go. What is embodied carbon? Well, it's all the extra carbon that is created uh, and released into the atmosphere by creating the materials, excavating the materials, moving those materials to site, and then putting them all together. Um, and how much does that matter? in the grand scheme of things, we'll see that at the end. But just generally, to test your knowledge, a poll, uh, kilogram for kilogram, which of these materials has a higher upfront embodied carbon? Cement, spray foam insulation, aluminum, steel, and solar photovoltaic panels. See what you guys think. 
good mix of responses. This is great. That's what I want to see. The trick is uh, kilogram per kilogram and you know upfront higher embodied carbon. So here we go. 141 of you responded already. So why don't we go up? So I, I'm really surprised by this. So there, you got about 25% of you pick cement, just above 25, 30% pick steel. The highest one on the list is actually the PV panels, believe it or not. But they are the only one on the list that will pay for themselves over time. Right? So there's a lot of energy that makes the PV panels. It's a highly engineered product. It has to be shipped from China, most likely. Um, I'm not ca causing the you know the labor issues there as well, but let's not talk about that. But so, so you get a bunch of PV panels, they ship them over. The good news is because you're offsetting carbon from the grid, because you're not buying carbon from the grid, the payback period on those PV panels is well below their, their life cycle. So if their life cycle is anywhere between 20 to even 40 years, sometimes they're lasting that long. There's some evidence to suggest the older PV panels do have that long of a lifespan, like 80% efficient at, at year 40. Um, let's assume they have a life cycle of about 20 to 25 years. Uh, the PV panels will pay for themselves in the UK grid, the current UK 0.19 carbon at around year 10. So putting them in um, is, is a very good idea uh, and is a, still a very sustainable thing to do. Um, in my country, uh, you picked up in the accent, our carbon, our grid on the carbon is, is much higher. Uh, so PV panels will pay for themselves from a carbon point of view uh, three, four times faster. Uh, and that's just because our, our grid is just so heavy with coal still, whereas you guys have, have moved most of your coal out of your grids a long time ago. Um, the next one on the list, if you take that one out of the list, just below it, believe it or not, is aluminium. My understanding is it has something to do with the smelting temperatures of the aluminium. Also, it's a lot lighter than steel. So uh, the amount of energy it, 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 to actually make and keep using aluminium is, uh, is, is bad about four or five times the same for steel. Um, steel would be the next one on the list. Spray foam insulation is kind of a, a it's, not a, it's not a big deal anymore because there's none of the, the chemicals that used to be in the canisters from a long time ago, they're not there. Now it's just compressed air. It's gonna be compressed CO2. Uh, so the, the, the global warming potential molecules that used to be in the canisters just aren't there anymore. And then there's finally there's cement. Now this one throws people. Kilogram for kilogram, cement or concrete in this instance is not particularly bad. It's not. It's just you have so much of it on site that it's almost always the single highest source of carbon uh, that will be affecting the, the, the buildings. Um, so especially when you start getting four stories or higher and you start getting into concrete frame buildings. I mean, there's just with with the, the piling and everything that goes into a proper modern skyscraper, um, cement and concrete just becomes a, a massively disproportionate uh, amount of the carbon. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, <laughs> so what is the embodied carbon cycle? Or, so, I mean, it's kind of not rocket science to understand this. Um, you 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 Get the, get the resources, you process them, and every step along this chain, you're adding a bit of carbon because you're changing something. You're using energy to change something. So, so what about how the basically you want to look at it is you have energy used times the volume of the material that you're creating, or weight usually, but same basic principle, times the life expectancy of that material. Now, concrete, That'll stay the whole life of the building. A lot of screeds that might stay the whole life of the building. But if I'm doing windows, well, how often do my windows? Do I have to change them, right? And then we're standardizing and now looking at that over a 60-year lifespan because we finally agreed that 60 years was a good lifespan to use. What is, is, is asking us to produce these at 100 years, a kind of a bug in my, my bonnet, uh, being in my bonnet. Uh, but most of the rest of the stuff now is kind of agreeing a 60-year lifespan. Uh, the industry still needs a bit of shoring up, but we're agreeing the lifespan is very important because now I can meaningfully compare 
my buildings against others of the same type. It, it, with, with before a few years ago, the lifespan was well. Let's look at this at 50 years. Look at this. It was really impossible to to look at how we would compare them. Anyway, uh, and then we would minus or 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 deduct anything that's reused, right, or actually recaptured. Um, sometimes steel I-beams, uh, things that are actually reused, not recycled. Recycling is a whole different thing, but when you're reusing it or recapturing it, you can deduct that off of the incoming materials, right? But here's the different scope. So we got cradle to gate, cradle to grave, grave, which is, you know, and then we got D, category D, which is that recapturing. Uh, it's also um, it's carbon sequester and storage. One of the things they ask is, some of the hemp or or other timber products. So we're taking and we're 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 at A1 to A3, they're actually negative. Some of the de declarations on the APDs will be negative because you're taking energy to create, chop down the trees, but then they're storing that carbon. You're actually taking it out of the atmosphere. It's actually it's a really good phenomenon. But at the end of the at the end of the life cycle, when I come to dispose of that, timber, uh, most likely I'm just going to light it on fire and put it in the ground somewhere anyway, right? <laughs> which is what we do with a lot of our materials if they're not properly put into a recycling loop. Um, and at any point, if a material goes through, let's say, four or five loops to the point where it changes, so I can't actually recover any more of that timber because now it's been hybridized and broken into chunks and a paper, it's too much glue in it, so I can't put it into the paper cycle. And then I'll say, well, I just, I'm going to burn it, reduce its volume. Uh, and then put the ash in, in a ground somewhere. Um, so all that carbon then is going to get released later. But for at least for a while, it's been held out of the atmosphere and stored somewhere for 60 years. So it's not contributing to the, to the atmosphere, atmosphere gain of carbon. Cool. OK, uh, these are the categories. One of the things that come up is uh, replacement. So repair, we don't get a lot of data on repair. Nobody repairs anything anymore, right? <laughs> so what they do is they replace it. Uh, so when my my boiler dies at year 20, right, I'm going to replace my boiler with a new one because at some point I can't keep fixing it. Same sort of thing with air source heat pumps and, and all the rest. Uh, that replacement for materials can be uh, quite a big category overall. All right, I said we we're going to talk about this. So double versus triple glazing. When when would I want to use double glazing versus triple glazing? The answer is it depends, right? depends on the type of the frame. It depends on how long that window is going to last. We usually assume it lasts about 40 years. Um, when would it pay for itself? Well, it, even with the carbon going down, triple glazing, generally speaking, still looks better. It's better to keep the heat and not burn my furnace, even though it takes more energy up front to actually make my third pane of glass and put it in the building. There are exceptions, a poor performing triple glazing versus a good performing double glazing. And if the building in question is really heavy in renewable, on-site renewable technology, we actually might be better off to heat a little bit of the heating system over 60 years than it would be to take the extra pane of glass and the energy to make that extra pane of glass uh, because you're, you know, you're making that twice. But it's just something to keep an eye on. It's kind of a point in the math where you don't really know where it's going to go. But normally, still today, triple glazing looks better. Uh, as soon as we hit zero carbon on the electricity grid, um, well, then we want to reduce the embodied carbon in materials as much as we possibly can, irrespective of how much energy I'm using, because the, the energy is carbon free. But somebody still has to pay for that energy, right? <laughs> so I don't think that'll ever happen. But it's still an interesting math equation, I suppose. If anybody's not heard of Letty, I have unabashedly stolen this from them. Like all credit where credit is due. They're a good little organization pumping around in, in, in London, doing really good work. Uh, and they have put together this climate emergency design guide. And, the re and I stole this from them. It's the one that's been around for a while. It's just, it's such a very good graph. It shows why over time, especially London Way, where you get skyscrapers. Um, it, embodied carbon just was never important. Nobody cared. But at some point, when we start decarbonizing our energy, the only thing left is the embodied carbon. 
Um, and we need to start tackling that, especially especially when 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 the numbers are are so big, when we're going up twenty six stories, you know, or whatever it is. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. And then they've set targets. Now Reba has set their targets too, uh, and the units aren't not you know coordinated perfectly well. Um, but the basic idea is we need to reduce embodied carbon, but we need to do so by not sacrificing our energy consumption. So a lot of the, the metrics involve passive house metrics and they're, they're starting to push down that. But now the, the gold standard uh, for small scale housing might be like 350 embodied carbon as opposed to 500. So they're really starting to push the envelope on this. None of these are law yet. None of the targets are law yet. Um, the London is now requiring the assessments be done. And then they're trying to say, well, we need to see improvement. They haven't really, you know, de define exactly what all that is because the assessments are coming in a bit, a bit haphazardly yet, and I do them, so I know. But at least it's starting to go in that direction, and I don't. And I think in a few years, uh, embodied carbon targets per meter squared is going to be either in law or 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 something. I know that um, the DFE and the MOD both also have targets uh, around those. Um, uh, so it's it's coming, <laughs> it's coming. You better better be get, trying to get ready for it. Uh, we're gonna have to do them regardless. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about quickly was the net zero case study, and then I'll I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. Um, so um, kilogram for kilogram. Oh, we already looked at this one. Wrong poll. Oh yeah, here it is. Um, all right. So the poll is supposed to read. Based on a particular site, which of these categories has the highest embodied carbon per category on the site? So, if I'm building a house, is most of my it, it was most of my carbon for a whole life cycle of the building going to be concrete, water, site impacts, or electricity? Remember that this is over 60 years. Probably didn't explain it very well. See what people think. All right. Well, the good news is most of you guys are picking between the two I wanted you to pick from. Um, 120 of you have responded. Most of you are picking electricity, and and some are picking concrete. Um, and that's that's actually very very much correct. So, you know, that's how it depends on how you define net zero, right? If it's net zero regulated or if it's net zero regulated and unregulated, right? True operational net zero, um, but, and how big the building is, right? <laughs> so the, the good news is it's either between A or D. Most of you guys have gotten that. Water does contribute to carbon emissions. It's not something that can be just ignored, but it's just, it tends to not be as big of a category as people think. Uh, and the same thing with site impacts. The actual building and construction of the building is just not that much energy. A4 is just not a very important category. All of the energy goes into making the materials, not at the very end where you kind of put it all together, if that makes sense, especially with, uh, you know, prefab modular becoming more and more, more and more um, uh, present in the industry. Uh, you, you just, all of that energy is is creating those things prior to bringing it to site. So, so concrete versus electricity. Let's explain our little case study. I picked this one because it's not a particularly good form factor, right? This house is a two and a half story. It was a traditional traditional build. Um, uh, it has roof lights in it, so that's cutting into my PV area. So this is a pair of semis. And the, the idea was to get to regulated operational net zero. Um, and he wanted to do that to secure a green mortgage. Uh, and and so long and the short of it, we got there. Space heating demand was reduced quite a bit. Um, the water heating, again, both of this was because of the heat pump that he put in. It was a, it was a pretty good, efficient heat pump. Uh, and then that's my that's my my lighting demand. So my lighting demand is almost equal to my water demand based on this particular model. And then he just filled the roof with PV. There was not enough roof area to allow for an a true a true operational net zero. So this was 
a regulated operational net zero. So we built this house all three, four years ago now. It was just before COVID uh, that was all getting finalized. And so it was at the time 40 years, you know, 50 years ahead of it, 40 years ahead of its time. Let's not exaggerate. So um, it's, at the time, it's still really good. It's still good. I mean, most houses wouldn't even come close to this in the UK. The fabric wasn't crazy. It was a 200 mil cavity wall is what he used. Uh, I've seen some that are worse now. Full fill, 400 mil wall. That was the big thing. He stuck with double glazing and he didn't put MVHR in. So it was just a, a, a you know a system one ventilation. He was a, and, and then he, he put in a wastewater heat recovery because I talked him into that because for bang for buck, it's a pretty good piece of kit if nobody's been been dealing with that. Uh, and then a combination of air source heat pump and PV. This was a very, even though I say fabric first, th this was not a passive house approach to net zero. This was very much a mechanical and electrical solution to net zero. Uh, and, and you're going to hit limits on how far that solution can take you by itself. But in this instance, for a house, it still it was doable. We, we, we got there. We got to a 2050 regs requirement um, tick. So how did it look from an embodied carbon point of view? Pretty awful. <laughs> uh, we, we, he didn't try to reduce embodied carbon. We, we assessed it. Um, and uh, he had a slab on ground foundation. So it was it was a raft he put in. I think he had PIR installation. I think it was, like, I don't know, 100, 120, 140, something like that. So the U values were all pretty good. Um, but he didn't do anything to reduce that upfront concrete load that he that he really had, I, 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 especially for a one-off house. But that's that was at the time that was his cheapest way of building in that location, and that's what they went with. And there was um, embodied carbon was kind of not important to them. At year twenty, we can see I re replaced the boiler. Uh, pardon me, the air source heat pump. And then at year forty, we're replacing uh, the air source heat pump and the windows. Is what I had in the model. Okay, give you an idea. But there's just all of this concrete up front is basically what it's coming. Um, so the electricity overall was the largest category. Uh, then we had concrete. Uh, the, the one thing that people forget about heat pumps, and this hopefully this problem is solving itself. But this was a few years ago when they still had R401A. So the heat pump that he used had R401A. This is a, a refrigerant with a global warming potential of 2,088, right? One, one, one gram, what is it, kilogram of that equals 2,088 kilograms of CO2 in the atmosphere effect, right? You can't even buy that anymore. You, you, it's been banned by the EU. I don't even think you can get them now. Uh, and now they've replaced them for R32. R32 is still like 800, right? But it's nowhere near 2,088. If you're going to like the valent, they've come out with a an R290 heat pump. That's propane, right? Same thing. Call it R290 in the world of refrigerants. They have, that has a global warming potential of four. So if that leaks, who cares? So it's, you know, so if this was a different heat pump selected, even if it's slightly less efficient, but it has a really, it has a much lower footprint from the refrigerant fluid, that would really make a difference in this in this as well. And then the unregulated electricity over 60 years. Yeah. All right, conclusions, because I, I got two minutes. So I'm right on time. Uh, less is best. If you don't need something, if you don't need to build something, just don't build it, right? <laughs> and if you don't need to build it, don't. Uh, but I still want a job, so don't completely stop constructing everything. Um, there you go. Aluminium and just metal in general. If you're not using it, you're using it for aesthetics. Just try try not to to specify it. I mean, if there's a reason in high rise, you can argue that the facades need to be up for a long time. Blah blah blah. If you're doing a low rise resi, if there there's really no reason for you to be actually putting this in from an, it's just for aesthetics. Just don't don't use it. Find a different material. Um, you could you'd be better off carbon wise to put in timber clad and have to change it every every three four years uh, just because of the the profile of how much carbon it 
you know, the carbon, the weight of the material for the aluminum. So if the aluminum lasts the entire lifetime of the building and the timber lasts 20 years and you have to replace it four times or three times over that 60 year life period, you're better using the timber three times than you are using the aluminum once because there's just so much carbon that goes into making that aluminum. Um, the exception is those hybrid windows where you got the timber on the inside and a little bit of aluminum on the flashing to protect and weatherproof the window frame on the outside. Those composite windows look really good in the calcs because we're getting all of the benefit of a timber window and we're getting that window to last a really long time. So that might be, you know, but that's just a tiny little bit of flashing. So it kind of makes sense. Um, <clears throat> cool. Reduce the foundations. Okay, if the building is lighter above and the concrete below can also be reduced, right? Try to talk to your, your, your engineers and get them to try to, to not over-engineer um, over the buildings, basically. And the lighter the foundation, the less the concrete, the less the concrete, you know, just less material goes kind of back to, to number one. If we can make anything lighter, we're better off doing so. Uh, use plant-based alternatives wherever I can, especially on finishes, right? Does everybody uses plasterboard? Um, what about timber floors or timber floating floors? Well, that's always going to be better than some sort of concrete finish or some sort of tile. Anytime I can get timber into the building, it's probably a win from a from an embodied carbon point of view. Uh, and then the last thing is design for recyclability. So I'm working with a couple of um, steel manufacturers where they're working to to decompile their panels, right? So they designing them or they lose the plasterboard, right? Can't can't save that, but I can decouple the, the, the actual wall and drag it somewhere else and just recouple it together. Uh, they're really trying to make it so that they don't lose all those materials at the end of the life cycle of the building, that they can actually legitimately design it in for recyclability. That's, that's the point. Uh, but generally it, it brings back to my point, and I'm seeing a couple of questions come through already. Um, Anytime I can reuse something, I'm better off because I'm not bringing something from somewhere else. How this happens in reality is the debate between when do I retrofit and when do I actually build something new? And, and, and it, it depends on how, how good of a retrofit we can do. A lot of the math that I've been looked at, some of the existing buildings are in such a state that you, you can't really retrofit them as successfully. Uh, others, you can retrofit them successfully, and, you, and you, then you, you should do, because there should be a legitimate reason. But it really comes down to site specificity. Um, yeah, definitely. Hopefully that makes sense. That's kind of the end of my presentation. I think we're here to answer questions for a few minutes. I can obviously stay around. Um, uh, yes, some of the questions. Isn't aluminum easily recycled? Yes, it is. Uh, the recycling of aluminum and steel are are it's great. So it's up, upwards 80, 90 percent of all the materials recycled, but you still need to resmelt it. You still need to be energy to pull it back into that stream. Uh, and, and, and that takes energy to keep it in the loop. Um, and then the debate between steel, you know, blast slag versus, you know, or, you know, the blast fire furnace versus the arc furnace. Well, you know, if we're using arc furnaces, that's a lot less energy, but it, we need to have that material already in cycling you know, in that, in that, in that loop. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Thanks for that, Brendan. Um, so we've got a question in from Stephen. Why are we still using 60 years as a lifespan measure? Surely this skews payback periods for better buildings with new technologies, i.e. makes them look expensive. Why 60 years? I don't have an answer. <laughs> I, I, I I didn't choose the 60 year lifespan. Why not 100 years? Maybe that 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 you know why aren't we looking at 100 years? But it's funny because um, the more the longer the lifespan, believe it or not, the less the importance of the initial embodied carbon. So uh, it becomes then down to replacement. So once the car once the carbon is in for the concrete, if I pull my 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 life cycle from 60 to 100 years, there's that many more windows that need to be replaced, that many more, um, that many more, you, you, you know, pieces of m and &E kit that need to be replaced, but the insulation's not going anywhere, right? The concrete frame isn't going anywhere. Um, and 
yeah, so that's the answer. So it actually it actually makes embodied carbon less important, uh, <laughs> which is kind of weird. But uh, I think the reason everybody picked 60 years and went with it is because they're trying to make it set. Uh, and a lot of the other countries are in and around that ballpark. Great. Um, probably a discussion point, but Graham said uh, it's really hard to persuade clients that environmentally sensitive materials are, are the right choice when the metrics don't back you up. So it probably goes back to a bits and bobs he was mentioning during the talk. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I suppose it, tim the only thing I can say to that is timber. Um, Get away from any insulation that's based on fossil fuels. PIR doesn't look very good. Uh, EPS looks better than XPS. Um, so you know EPS can be can be sustainable if you're recapturing it. So material choice matters, I suppose, and that's and that's the reality. Because if you're going to burn it at the end, <laughs> which is what kind of the model that ends up predicting anyway, we want to make sure that we're actually designing things that they can be recaptured. Um, I did a I did a, a a railway platform, kind of weird. But they they floated it on EPS, and the argument was that that EPS is eventually going to get burnt. But the EPS was in such large blocks that it was easily recoverable. But I don't I can't capture that in a model, so I need to explain it later. You know, so it's just interesting stuff. So it's something a little bit more specific. Chris is asking how much roof and floor insulation was there proposed or introduced in the French Weir project. Yep, sure. So uh, roof insulation was U value of 0 0.09 because the cold roofs uh, next to the next to the sloping bit. So three, uh, 350, 400 mil of rock wool ish. And then the, 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 the insulation was PIR with a thermal laminate underneath. Uh, the U values weren't crazy. They were pretty normal. Um, I think the U value for the the sloping roof was like 0.15, and then the the roof was 0.09 uh, for the for the cold roof part, and then for the floor it was yeah 0.1. I mean I don't I don't see a lot of roof and floor values that aren't like that. Those U values are pretty standard now across the industry. It's and have been for for a long time. The only thing we debate about is the wall thickness because that's where the cost of the the construction is. The thicker the wall, the the more expensive everything is. But Floor insulation and the roof insulation; those U values are have been set for for quite a long time, I guess. Uh, a couple of people have asked something on the similar tangent for for this question, so I'm just going to pick out from one person. So Said has is basically asking: Is it preferable to refurbish rather than build as new? Uh, in essence, what's the balance? I think furthermore, probably we have a situation where we have millions of properties which are already built within this country from varying. Um, uh, varying eras so there's obviously there's quite a lot to consider as well as the historical implications when for example looking at maybe a listed building yeah i, I can't comment on your cultural obsession with aesthetics um <laughs> i don't have a horse in that race okay so, so if we take aside the aesthetics when we're allowed to upgrade the ones we can upgrade we should be picking the ones that are easily upgradable. Anything with a solid wall is easier to upgrade as long as I can insulate externally. And it's all about whether or not I have the space, I, I have the, the, the feasibility to actually insulate externally. If I'm doing a terrace and I own the mid terrace, do I have a right to, to insulate externally, but my neighbors don't, or do I have to change the whole thing? Um, these are, these is, this is why there's no one fit solution for the retrofit market, unfortunately. But yeah, generally speaking, we want to be refurbishing um, as long as there's space, you know, for a cylinder, for a, for an air source heat pump, uh, hempcrete, you know, yeah, if I'm building new, you know, these sort of alternative materials are great. But if I'm retrofitting, uh, I don't even have to spend any energy to recreate that structure. And that's the whole benefit. But if that structure then is insufficient to be an insulated structure, then for the next 60 years, my heating bills are still going to be higher than if I had knocked it on, knocked it down and started over. So it's a debate, honestly. I have it really depends on the specific project to know when I should knock it down or when I should actually um, retrofit. 
And we'll, we'll wrap it up with a final question from uh, Lawrence. When designing a new build, how much can you affect your lifetime carbon? Uh, for example, by using landscaping, solar shading from trees, uh, and can you use that in the final figures as they may not be there for the whole life cycle? Oh, well, are, are you, if the question I understood it to be, if I put in trees that then block out my, my energy 10 years from now, but not right away, that sort of modeling can be done. It's not something we would get in, we would normally do on an everyday basis. Um, what was the beginning part of that question again? Uh, I think it was almost, how in essence i think in essence what it is is when designing a new build um is there the sort of longer because we're looking at lifetimes of buildings yeah is there are elements where we can bring in for example this is a off tangent probably from the calculations you're currently doing then from what you've answered with but is there are there ways to bring in these other elements for example looking at it from an even for an even more detailed consideration of uh the way in which your landscape might change around you yeah, I mean, you can always you can always do that modeling. You can just change the model and run it for 10 years and then add it all up at the end. I mean, there's ways of doing that detailed analysis if you want to. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think I'm, I've been ever asked to do anything that detailed over time. Um, yeah. But the biggest thing I can say is that we need to get the fossil fuels out of the buildings. So we can debate to the cows come home about how much PV to roof area and whatever, but if that building is not on electricity and it is still on gas, it will never be zero carbon because I can never, you know, I, I need to move to electrifying heat. And then we can talk about how efficient that is in decarbonizing the grid. Uh, yeah. And that's the next big step as we move to a, a net zero future, I think. Yeah, no, when definitely. you make that step. Yeah, you've, you've raised some really interesting points and gone into a, a sort of really, really nice amount of detail and obviously uh, slightly highlighted the Letty um, information that, that's uh, available online. Um, there's obviously the part Z, um, which is um, available online, uh, yet to obviously pass through Parliament, etc. There's been the upgrades to part L. So it touches on quite a lot of different areas as well. We've got the overheating sort of elements of things to consider as well. It's just so many, so many different areas and offshoots and obviously Obviously, all of those items that I've just briefly highlighted, which a couple of Brandon highlighted within his talk, could potentially make their own talks altogether. Um, so hopefully everyone's happy with um, uh, ending that there today. What I'll do is I'll just quickly share my screen and highlight a few of our upcoming um, events so we've obviously thank you very much to uh, brandon uh, darren and kashiba for uh, today's talk uh, which was obviously achieving net zero carbon in construction uh, the next event which is a face-to-face -face event which is being held in bristol which is a where's it at careers in technology which will be held at the engine shed on this friday between two and four um, it's uh, predominantly geared towards students but obviously all welcome um, so please do attend if you can um, Following that, we've got on the same evening, so this Friday, uh, we've got the charity uh, event, which is going to be held at the Harbour House in Bristol. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, all welcome. We're raising money for the Grand Appeal. Uh, tickets are £30 plus booking fee. Uh, there'll be drinks, dinner, quiz, raffle, uh, networking, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, it's all been sponsored by Autodesk with some match funding from Barrett Homes, which is great. Um, and then going back to our CPD and 43 schedule, this is the final one for the year. So this will be on Wednesday, the 7th of December. Um, this is a really interesting piece of software, which is a space maker for conceptualization and early site design, uh, where you're able to sort of put in parameters and really sort of play with the potential options that you can create for any said site. So thank you again. Thank you, everybody. And uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you all soon. We'll be working on our 2023 schedule um, uh, over the course of the next uh, month or so, and we'll be launching that in due course. Bye, everyone. Great. Thank you so much. It was lovely to meet with everyone. Um, I hope you've seen in the chat, but I've